So it's finally here. I have my Raspberry Pi 5. Let me tell you everything I love about it, everything I'm not really so keen on, and why it reminds me so much of Captain Marvel. <laughs> Hello once again, Pi Geeks and Techno Nerds all around the world. My name is Jeff and I'm an IT professional who's been in the industry for over 30 years. In my spare time, I like nothing more than making little projects out of Raspberry Pis. I'm sure you do too. If you like this video, please go ahead and hit the like button. Subscribe if you want to see more and hit the notification bell to be notified of whenever I put out another video. This time, I'm going to be taking a look at the brand new Raspberry Pi single board computer and comparing it to an old Raspberry Pi 4. Now what I'm going to have here is the Pi 4 and the Pi 5, both configured with the latest Raspberry Pi OS, so that they're effectively comparing like with like. They're both going to be running at a resolution of 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames a second, so it will be a fair comparison. Now before we get going, let's take a quick look at the Raspberry Pi 5 and some of its features. If we look on the front side here, what we see is that there's a gigabit Ethernet port, two USB 3.0 ports, and two USB 2.0 ports. Switching around by 90 degrees, we can see there's a USB-C socket for power, there's two micro HDMI sockets, there's now no audio socket, which I know will annoy some people. Personally, I don't mind so much, but I get if people were relying on that. In place of the audio port, we now have two MIPI connectors, and these can be used to connect cameras or LCD displays. Switching around to the rear edge, we can see there's a brand new PCI Express connector, and this will allow connectivity to all kinds of new devices that we could never think of playing with before. And there's also one thing that a lot of people have been screaming out for. There's a power button for the Raspberry Pi. So you can finally cleanly turn off your Raspberry Pi and switch it on again afterwards. On the fourth long edge of the Raspberry Pi are the ever-present GPIO pins. These are what you can use to connect to all kinds of other electronics. So in effect, they're the Pi's interface to the outside world. The other really major addition to the Pi 5 is the Raspberry Pi 1 chip. This is a chip that controls all of the I.O. on the board. Previously, the CPU had to deal with all I.O. itself. Now it's got a little companion chip that it can run alongside with to offload some of that functionality. This means that the Raspberry Pi 5 can cope with an awful lot more I.O. than the Raspberry Pi 4 or previous could ever do. But let's go and take a look at just how well it can perform. First off, let's take some CPU stats. In order to capture the CPU stats from each of the Raspberry Pis, I'm going to be using the ever popular Geekbench software. I've got that installed on both of the Raspberry Pis here. Let's just run it and see how well it performs. Now this will take some time to run. So let's just let this go and we'll come back later when it's finished. OK, so everything's now finished. Let's go and take a look at the results. And here the results really are quite amazing. So you can see in both single core and multi core, the Raspberry Pi 5 is more than twice as good as the Raspberry Pi 4. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation really have made a tremendous step forward in the power of the processor. But CPU stats aren't the whole story. Let's go and take a look at I.O. and initially take a look at disk statistics. Both Raspberry Pis have an identical SanDisk 32GB microSD card installed. So the first thing I want to do is take a look at what the read performance is like against the card in each Pi. As you can see, the Pi 5 is able to read data from the card at twice the data rate that was available in the Raspberry Pi 4. This is an incredible step up in performance. But now let's take a look at write performance. To test the write performance, what I'm going to do is take a load of random data, two gigabytes in total, and write it out to an area on the micro SD card. This will give us a good idea of how write performance compares between the two Raspberry Pis. Let's go and try that now. As you can see, when it starts, the write performance on the Pi 5 seems to be a very long way ahead of the Pi 4, but it does eventually even out. All I can think there is that there's better caching performance within the Pi 5, but it's hard to say for sure.
as you can see, overall, the performance isn't that much different. 1 minute 21 on the Pi 5, 1 minute 31 on the Pi 4. This is quite a surprising result given how different the read performance is. The next thing I'm going to try is reading and writing from a USB 3 thumb drive. This should have much better performance than the micro SD card that we tried earlier. But let's try it and see. Obviously, where I've only got one of these and I want to test the exact same stick, I need to do these one at a time. So let's do the Pi 4 first. With this USB thumb drive, it's really clear that the Pi 5 has vastly better performance. I think a lot of this is because the Pi 1 chip that is dedicated to I.O. now frees up the real power of the USB 3 ports. In the Pi 4, all of this I.O. was fed through the CPU, whereas the Pi 5 has dedicated hardware for it, and so it's way more performant. The next thing I want to try is an NVMe drive that's also connected through the USB 3 ports. Let's see how well that does. OK, so now we've got the NVMe drive connected. Let's try it first in the Raspberry Pi 4 and see what happens. Firstly, we'll perform the read test. And now, once again, we'll do the write test. OK, not bad. Let's unmount it from the Pi 4 and we'll try it on the Pi 5. Again, first we'll try the reads. A significant win for the Pi 5 there. And now we'll try the writes. And wow, yes, yet again, it's nearly twice the performance on the Pi 5. The Pi 1 chip is really an amazing addition to the little single board computer. OK, so now we've seen that CPU and disk performance is vastly superior on the Raspberry Pi 5 compared to the Pi 4. But now let's take a look at the GPU and see how well that performs on the new Pi. I'll be using a set of benchmarks from Geeks Labs in order to do this. They're a great set of tools for just this purpose. Let's go and jump over to the desktop of the Pi 4 and then go and take a look. Here on this first test, you can see on the Pi 4, we're only getting about four frames a second. Not exactly that impressive. If we switch over to the Pi 5, you can see that's doing much, much better at 13 frames a second. So let's go and take a look at another test. On this second test, things initially look a lot better for the Pi 4. It's running there well over 20 frames a second. But if we flip over to the Pi 5, running the same test, it's well over 80. This is another very, very big win for the Pi 5. And the theme continues with this test here. The Pi 4 is barely kicking three frames a second here. Whereas on the Pi 5, it's getting at least a double figures. Now, OK, it's not exactly a gaming powerhouse, but it's still a long way ahead of where the Pi 4 was. With simpler work, like what you see here, the Pi 4 doesn't do too bad. I mean, it is over 20 frames a second. But when you compare that again with the Pi 5 being over 80, you can see the difference that the new GPU makes. This last test is way more demanding. And on the Pi 4 here, you can see it's only getting as far as two frames a second. It's really, really struggling. And if we switch to the Pi, yeah, it's still three times as good. It's made it to six, but it is still in single figures. So you're definitely not going to be seeing any AAA gaming on a Raspberry Pi anytime soon. So from all the tests that we've run there, you can truly see that Raspberry Pi 5 is really like Captain Marvel. Higher, further, faster, baby. However, it's not actually all good news. Remember I mentioned the PCI Express socket earlier? Well, there are some fundamental problems with that. You see, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have not actually published any specs about this whatsoever. 
not a pinout diagram or anything. So they're kind of actively discouraging people from trying to use it. I can't really understand why they do that. The board is meant for makers, yet we can't make anything. Indeed, if we take a look at this forum here, you can see that the Raspberry Pi Foundation were quizzed about why pinouts weren't available. And even they were surprised that they hadn't been published yet. This is a real red flag to me, as it suggests that they're actually worried that something could be wrong there. Maybe the kernel support for the PCI Express interface is still a little bit flaky, and maybe some damage could be done. I don't know. But it's certainly really worrying that they haven't published the specs for them. As far as I can remember, this is the first time this has happened with the Raspberry Pi. Even with the Raspberry Pi 1 back in the day, all of the GPIO pins were fully documented upon launch. Now, some people, of course, have been able to successfully play with a PCI Express interface. Jeff Geerling, for example, on his website and on his fantastic YouTube channel, has been experimenting with the PCI Express interface on the Pi 5. He was actually provided with a debug board from the Raspberry Pi Foundation themselves. Of course, no such boards are actively available to the public right now. And this is a real shame, but it is leading to people such as this guy to reverse engineer the interface and find out for himself how it works and what the pinouts are. Now, of course, doing anything like this does carry risk with it as well, and especially with Raspberry Pi 5s being in relatively short supply right now. I'm not sure I'd want to take the risk with mine. So I'm just very, very hopeful that the Raspberry Pi Foundation will publish all of the specifications for the interface really soon and confirm that it is ready for use. The other thing I'm very disappointed about with the Raspberry Pi 5 is the fact that whilst the GPU does have hardware video encoding enabled within it, Raspberry Pi OS and its kernel doesn't have that support. Now within the Raspberry Pi 4, the hardware video encoder was enabled. I made use of that in my video about building a Raspberry Pi sling box. If you haven't seen that, I'll put a link for it up here. Now, obviously, I wanted to do something quite similar with the Raspberry Pi 5 and take advantage of its increased I.O. capabilities. But I've been blocked from doing so because the hardware video encoder isn't accessible. The Raspberry Pi Foundation were asked about this and Gordon Hollingworth had this to say. Essentially, what he said was that it's not a priority for them. And that within software, you could take a 1080p 60 frames a second stream and encode it in software using one processor. Well, I thought I'd give that a go. So that's what I'm doing here. What I've got is my Raspberry Pi 5, and I've attached to it a USB 3 video capture device. Now, in the top of the screen, I'm running HTOP so you can see how heavily loaded it is while it runs. In the bottom, the command that's running there is really, really complex. But essentially, all it's trying to do is take in the stream from the video capture card as raw video and then encode it using H.264 within software. So let's kick that off. Now, what you immediately see here is in this FPS figure down the bottom, it's only able to keep up with about 20 frames a second, like not even a third of what it's meant to be. And this is also backed up by the speed here where it's saying 0.25. If that were reading one, then it would be able to keep up with the stream as it came in, but it's clearly incapable of doing so. And it's just suffering increasingly with buffering issues. Now, this is really no good and it's incredibly disappointing because it blocks me from doing a whole bunch of different projects using the Pi 5. It also makes me think of another analogy with Captain Marvel. In the first movie, she was unable to exploit all of her powers because she was just being held back by the Kree. It was only when she was able to unlock that that she was able to realize what her power was and what she was capable of doing. And I feel it's exactly the same with the Raspberry Pi 5. It's a tremendous device and it's got so much potential. Now, if you're just looking for a pure power upgrade from a Pi 4, the Pi 5 is fine just as it is. Its CPU and GPU are already way, way more powerful than what was in the Pi 4. However, if you're trying to exploit the fact that there's now a PCI Express slot on the Pi 5, or you want to do some video encoding projects and exploit the increased I.O. capabilities of the Pi 5, you just can't because that functionality is locked out to you. It's really sad. So I view the Raspberry Pi 5 almost as a little bit rushed to market. It feels like they've held back some of its capabilities 
in order to have a little bit more time in research and development before releasing everything for it. And that's just not good for anyone in the community when the board is designed to be for makers. But that's everything for this video. Once again, if you like what you see here, please click the like button, subscribe if you want to see more, and please click the notification bell to be notified of when I put out another video. Thanks so much for watching until the end, and until next time, bye for now. Thank you.